Well, thank you, David. That's, um, it's a real uh, privilege to be here, um, a privilege that I decided to share with my doppelganger. This is um, Dr. Gero. <laughs> we, have, um, we have many more things in common than just the first name. Um, he's also a scientist, um, a mad one, uh, in a Japanese comic called Dragon Balls. Um, he strives for world domination, just like I do. <laughs> and, um, and if you look carefully, you can see that his skull has been replaced with a transparent plexiglass dome so that the workings of his brain can be controlled with light. And that's, of course, exactly what we do. We <laughs> modify specific neurons genetically so that they can respond to optical signals. And these two essential ingredients, genes and photons of light, have given the field its name, optogenetics. Before I explain how it works, let's consider just briefly why being able to interfere with the function of the brain is an important thing to be able to do. If you like puzzles, and um, as a neuroscientist you'd better, you probably know that staring long and hard at a difficult problem not always gives you the answer. It's often much more productive to play with the problem, to try different solutions, to see whether you can find a pattern that falls into place. But I think it's fair to say that historically, neuroscientists have mostly stared at the brain and not played with it. Part of the reason is the enormous complexity of the nervous system. Even the brains of the fruit flies that we study are composed of several hundred thousands of nerve cells of many different flavors, with millions of connections between them. Where to begin? But there's one organizing principle behind this seemingly impenetrable complexity, and that's the genetic blueprint that orchestrates the development of the nervous system. The core idea of optogenetics is to use this blueprint as the foundation for our experimental strategies to interfere with function. We use specific marker genes to highlight specific classes of neurons, and then we insert into the membranes of these neurons ion channels. These ion channels are just like the molecules that are responsible for all electrical signaling in the nervous system, with one important difference. These channels are coupled to photoreceptors. So when a photon of light hits the photoreceptor, it changes shape. The shape change is transduced to um, the pore of the channel. The channel opens, a current flows, and the neuron fires an electrical impulse. Now, what motivated the invention of optogenetic control was the idea that a technology like this would um, open three experimental doors that had previously been locked. The first of these doors is the identification of the neuronal causes of behavior. If you could play back into the brain specific electrical activity patterns and thereby recreate perceptions, actions, memories, emotions, you could then credibly claim that you have really understood what normally underlies these aspects of our mental lives. The second locked door is the search for connections between neurons, which is essential for understanding the wiring diagram of the brain. If one could do this by scanning a light beam across neural tissue, this would be a much more efficient way of going about the problem than a painstaking search probing with electrodes. And the third, of course, um, is the probing of neuronal mechanisms. If you had an idea how something worked, then being able to interfere with the system would be the way to tell you whether your ideas are correct or wrong. So to illustrate what's now possible, I've chosen one problem from our recent work in which optogenetics has allowed us to open all three of these previously locked doors. And that problem is the neuronal control of sleep. Sleep is one of the great biological mysteries. Every night, we disconnect ourselves from the world for seven or eight hours, a state that leaves us vulnerable and unable to do what we need to do in order to propagate the species. Yet, despite these risks and costs, we still don't know what sleep is good for. It's widely thought that there is two control mechanisms in the brain that determine whether we are asleep <coughs> or awake. And these controllers are symbolized here by two different forms of oscillation. 
the sine wave symbolizes the circadian clock, which oscillates in synchrony with predictable changes in the external environment that are caused by the Earth's rotation. As such, the clock doesn't really go to the core function of sleep. It can explain why we do our sleeping at certain times, but it does not explain why we need to sleep in the first place. That explanation is likely to come from understanding the second sleep control system, a system called the sleep homeostat that's symbolized here by the sawtooth oscillation. While we are awake, something, and we don't know what that something is, accumulates. And when that something reaches a certain ceiling, we go to sleep. The system gets reset while we are asleep, and when we wake up, the cycle begins anew. I think that understanding what that something is, whose accumulation puts us to sleep, would provide the key clue to solving the mystery of why we need to sleep in the first place. Now, we know a, lo we know a lot about the circadian clock. And um, this is the Rosetta Stone that actually broke the problem open. The discovery 45 years ago of fruit flies whose circadian clocks run abnormally fast or slow. From that discovery flowed a complete, pretty complete, uh, molecular, cellular, and systems understanding of circadian timekeeping. Now this slide, in contrast, summarizes much of what we know about the function of the sleep homeostat. <laughs> My goal for the rest of the talk will be to, to try and draw at least a few outlines um, on this blank canvas. The story begins with the discovery by Jeff Donnelly and Paul Shaw of sleep control neurons in the brains of fruit flies. Optogenetics has allowed us to identify these sleep control neurons as the output arm of the sleep homeostat and to demonstrate that these cells exert an extremely powerful influence over sleep and waking. <coughs> This is how we do the experiments. A fruit fly is fixed to a mount and placed on a spherical treadmill, a little styrofoam ball, whose rotations we measure with an optical computer mouse. Since there are no documented cases of somnambulism in flies, um, we know that when the fly is walking, it must be awake. What you can see is that we're also measuring the electrical activity of one of the sleep control neurons in the brain, and we have expressed our optical remote control in all of the sleep control neurons. Now this is an experiment lasting for half an hour. You see that during the first few minutes, the sleep control neuron is quiet and the fly is moving along happily. When we turn on the lights, the sleep control neuron becomes electrically active, it emits electrical impulses, and all movement quickly stops. The fly goes to sleep. When we switch the neurons back off, the fly wakes up again and starts to walk. When we switch the sleep control neurons back on, the fly goes back to sleep. So we have isolated a switch in the brain that allows us to toggle the animal between sleep and waking. Further studies have revealed that these sleep control neurons normally exist in two states, one in which they are electrically active, shown here on the left, and another in which they are electrically silent, shown here on the right. And we've sampled these neurons in many, many different flies and found that the state of the neuron typically correlates with the sleep state of the fly. The fly is uh, asleep when the sleep-promoting neurons are active, and they're awake when the sleep control neurons are silent. So this suggests the um, simple view that homeostatic sleep control works by switching these neurons between electrically active and electrically silent states. Now, in order to really demonstrate this, one would, of course, want to be able to observe state switching by an individual sleep control neurons. One would like to understand how the switch actually works. And as I said in my introduction, one would really like to know what are the signals that normally flip the switch. Now, a clue as to what one such signal uh, might be had come many, many years ago in um, the first optogenetic control experiments of animal behavior that my then graduate student, Susanna Lima, did more than 12 years ago at Yale. Um, Susanna had expressed our optical remote control in all neurons in a fly's brain that signal through the messenger molecule dopamine. Angie had measured the activity of fruit flies. You see here four examples. Each column represents the same fly, the, the, the movement tracks of the same fly, 
for two minutes before and after Susana switches on the dopamine neurons. You see that when the dopamine system is off, the flies don't move much. And when she switches the dopamine neurons on, the animals become highly aroused. Now this arousing effect of dopamine <coughs> is consistent with the known role of dopamine in our own brains. Drugs that act as stimulants, like cocaine or amphetamine, do so by elevating dopamine levels in the brain. So you would, of course, expect that an arousal-promoting substance like dopamine shuts down the sleep-promoting cells. And there is, in fact, a potential anatomical substrate to do this. There's dopaminergic neurons that invade the brain region that's inhabited by the sleep control neurons. In fact, the dopamine cells shadow the sleep control cells so tightly that they seem almost tailor-made to powerfully control their influence. And that's indeed what they do, as optogenetics has taught us. We could probe for connections between these two classes of neurons simply by using light to activate the dopamine cells and then checking what would happen to the sleep-promoting cells. And this is what happened. We start out with the sleep control cells in the electrically active state, then we apply dopamine, and uh, the cells indeed switch from the active to the inactive state. They fall silent. And this silencing of the sleep-promoting cells drives the awakening of the fly, which then starts to move. In many cases, we also see the flip back of the cell from the electrically silent back to the electrically active state, and the fly goes back to sleep. Now, being able to control this sleep switch in a targeted fashion has also um, allowed us to dissect how the mechanism actually works. And I've summarized what we found in a simple animation. In electrically active cells um, that fire electrical impulses, a molecule that we have termed Sandman is sequestered in the inside of the cells. And when dopamine binds to its receptor on the cells, it causes the translocation of Sandman to the outside of the cells. Sandman is a passive leak channel that short circuits the electrical activity of these sleep promoting cells and shuts them off. So what I've described to you then is a device that in many respects is very, uh, very similar to one that you're all familiar with because you have it on the walls of your sitting rooms. But instead of this device measuring temperature and turning on the heat when it's too cold, it measures sleep need and puts you to sleep when your sleep need exceeds its set point. The billion dollar question in all of this, of course, is what is the equivalent of temperature in this system? Before I conclude, let me take you back for just um, one or two minutes into the stone age of optogenetics. <coughs> After we had started to work on um, the first um, of these optogenetic control technologies, I became aware that another scientist um, had seen the need for technology like this. And that scientist was Francis Crick, one of the discoverers of the double helical structure of DNA. In a paper that was published in the millennial issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, Crick wrote that the next requirement for understanding the brain is to be able to turn the firing of one or more types of neuron on or off in a rapid manner in the behaving animal. The ideal signal would be light. This seems rather far-fetched, but it is conceivable that molecular biologists could engineer a particular cell type to be sensitive to light in this way. So when we had the first experiments that turned this far-fetched idea into a reality, and here are these experiments, this is a cell grown in culture, which expresses the light-gated channel. And you see that the electrical activity of the cell is quiet in the dark, but as soon as we switch on the light, the cell responds with a volume of electrical impulses. So when we had these experiments, I sent a preprint of the paper to Francis Crick, who uh, replied in his characteristic style. If you read the wonderful book uh, called The Eighth Day of Creation, which recounts the early history of molecular biology, you know that Crick was a prolific letter writer who steered the development of the field through a vast correspondence that always mixed two stylistic hallmarks, encouragement and constructive criticism. And that's exactly what I got. Crick wrote that he had read the paper I had sent him with great interest 
and was excited to see that the system already works, at least to some extent. <laughs> However, he realized, as I did, that it still needed improvement and that this would take further work. Unfortunately, Craig did not live to hear how our experiments progressed, and not just ours, but those of many others who later joined the field. But I think it's fair to say that as a result of all of these efforts, the way we neuroscientists go about our business has fundamentally changed. Neuroscience has been transformed from an observational into an interventionist discipline. Thank you. Gero, we like looking at applications of innovations. Where do you see your amazing research fitting into real-world use cases? So I think there's two, um, two strands where optogenetics can have practical applications. The first, of course, is it's a discovery tool. It helps us understand the function of the brain um, and to pin specific uh, neuronal function to specific classes of cells in ways that were not previously possible. And it's possible then to look for conventional um, medicines that can target these responsible neurons more cleanly and more effectively than what is currently possible. And the second uh, potential application is, of course, um, an attempt to use optogenetics directly um, as a therapeutic approach. Now that has um, a number of obstacles. Um, I would identify at least three. One is technical. Obviously, one has to introduce a foreign gene into the brain. One has to <coughs> install a light delivery system. The second um, is ethical, legal. Um, is it okay to interfere with the function of somebody else's brain? And the third is intellectual. Do we know enough about how the brain works to make targeted interventions? Just explain very briefly what you do when you go to work in the morning. Is there a lab with lots of microscopes and lots of flies and lots of people inserting little cables? How does it work? Yes, that's, that's typically how it works. So I, I uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, of, it's, uh, and of course, it's a very, um, a very secretive layer where we do all of this. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a normal university research lab uh, that's populated by, at the moment, um, three graduate students and uh, seven postdocs, uh, one engineer and one technician. And um, most of the people are fully in command of their own projects. So I don't go in there and tell everybody what they have to do during that day, but we um, often meet and um, discuss the results. Um, my role is similar to that of, um, um, I guess, uh, as a, a person, an entrepreneur running a small business. Um, I'm responsible for the, um, the development of the product. I'm responsible for human resources. And I also have to um, raise the money to be able to do our research from funding institutions such as the Wellcome Trust. And then at the end, I have to sell the product. I have to get our results published. Um, and then the cycle begins anew. Just another startup entrepreneur. That's, that's exactly what um, it is. Well, you've had tons of, research, tons of, um, kind of acclaim from your peers. You're going to get a lot more recognition. Let's thank Gero Meisenbock from the University of Oxford. Thank you.